All right, Revelation 10. Revelation 10 is what we're studying. And uh, I'm just amazed at God's Word. I, uh, after the funeral, Cubby, I came over here and uh, recorded a new Watchman broadcast. It's being uploaded now. And you know how you always think you know what the Bible says, like in your mind? And then when you read it, you find out you were wrong, right? And, and you find out you were wrong in a good way because then it's like, whoa. And while I was recording yesterday afternoon, um, I looked at a verse that I was going to talk about and I kept misquoting it. And when I got ready to read it, when I looked at it, I went, and it was just one word. It was, it was the change of one word in it. And I went, oh my goodness. Because, well, I won't get into all of it because you won't, you won't know what I'm talking about yet. You have to watch the watchman. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Right. Nothing. I didn't think so. Who? Somebody just make that up, or? Yeah. I'll give you something else. Um, you turn to um, Revelation ten, Psalm one thirty nine, and we'll go from there. But another example of, of um, what we were just talking about. Now, now I've lost my mind. It's gone from my mind what it was. Yeah, what else is new? I can't tell you what else is new because I don't remember. Man, what was that? Oh, well, it'll come to me. It was, no, it wasn't that. It was something, oh, I remember, thank you, I remember now. When I left here and went to Oklahoma to go to Bible college, Oklahoma and Texas, uh, if, if like Texas, Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia are the Bible belt of the country, Texas and Oklahoma are the charismatic buckles of it. I mean, there is more charismatic churches uh, from Oklahoma City, from Tulsa to Oklahoma City to Dallas-Fort Worth in that area, Houston, uh, and so on. And I never heard this word ever before, but I get out there to Bible college and they have a really good Christian radio station, plays Southern Gospel music. And so I liked it, started listening to it and would listen to some of the teachings during the day. And I kept hearing the word Shekinah. And people were talking about the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. And that puzzled me as a young, as a young, uh, soon to be minister, because I'm thinking, okay, is there something that I wasn't told here, something I wasn't taught that I need to learn and teach because it's in the Bible. Um, but I never found it in the Bible. Uh, but I kept hearing people talk about the Shekinah glory. I come back here to Missouri. Then I start hearing Missouri preachers talk, and people talk about the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. And I'm like, I still don't know what they're talking about. And they would say, well, it's the presence of God there uh, in, as he's the, like the pillar of fire in the tabernacle. And I'm going, okay, but where is that? And no one can point me to the scriptures. So I'm thinking, well, maybe it's in the Hebrew and I couldn't find it then. Back then we didn't have the tools, the digital tools that we have now. And so I'm reading um, years later. I'm reading uh, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. And The Da Vinci Code, one of the themes of that book is 
he talks about something that has been worshipped for thousands of years called the divine feminine, the sacred feminine, or the goddess, the fertility goddess. And I went, okay, I know who that is. That's Ashtaroth in the Old Testament. That's who she is. Or Mystery Babylon. Um, but then, in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, he dropped a bomb on me when I read that the Hebrew Shekinah was the same as Ashtaroth, the female goddess that God told him not to worship, and all these other divine goddesses throughout history, and it's the idea of the sacred feminine, that a female is herself a goddess, and that she has uh, the goddess glory on her called the Shekinah. And I went, so I did some checking. Uh, and I have a friend who is a, he's one of my buddies from Hillsdale, and he is a, still a good friend of mine today. And um, I knew he knew the Hebrew and the Greek. I knew he knew it like the back of his hand. And I called him and I said, can you find the word Shekinah for me in the Hebrew Old Testament? And he, he said, no, it's not there. And I said, Craig, where are they getting this from? He said, I don't know. But anyway, um, there is a masculine word. Uh, Hebrew has genders to it. There is a masculine word called Shekhan. And it's translated as the glory of the Lord. But it's a masculine noun. It's a masculine name, meaning male. God is a male. He is our father. He gave... He brought to us his son. There's no getting around that. And, uh, but I found out that if you go to the Sistine Chapel, did you guys go to the Vatican? And you're, oh, next time you go, go to the Vatican. Take pictures. Well, then I'm going to go. In the Sistine Chapel, you know, you have that famous painting of God reaching down to Adam to touch fingers to give him life. God's right hand is trying to reach Adam. His left arm is around a bare-chested, red-headed woman. Shekinah. It's God's girlfriend. God's consort. His, um, oh, what is it when you're, uh, Solomon had a, a, a concubine. And the idea was that when God and his concubine, Shekinah, came together and mated, that glory was released. It's sickening. But that's, what the te that's where it comes from. And it's one of those words that you keep hearing preachers use. They have no idea that it's not in the Bible. Not only is it not in the Bible, God said, don't worship her. And people are dumb and they, they're doing just that. All right, now, Revelation 10. That was your first Sunday school lesson. Now, Revelation 10. So, what I'm getting at is, rule number one, if it's not in the Bible, it's not. It doesn't exist. If there's something God wants us to know about what is happening in this world right now, or what is going to happen in this world... He will write it. He has already written it down in his word. And he will in time reveal it to those who seek it. If you knock with God, what happens? He opens. If you uh, ask, what happens? God gives. If you seek, you'll find. God guarantees that. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, call in me and I'll answer thee. Great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Revelation 10, verse 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Again, that's, to me, that's the glory of the Lord. And the only one who has the right to uh, have part or be a partaker of the glory of the Lord is God himself. He says, 
My name is the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another or share with another. I can't remember what it says. But God does not share his glory with some other God or goddess like Mary. Amen. Now, verse 2, he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And we've been studying what that book is relating to uh, what the word of God says. Uh, Psalm 139, in thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And so we examine this, in thy book all my members were written, all the parts of our body, all the parts of this body have been written in the book of life for this church. All of those who call themselves Bible believers, who trust in the Lord with all their heart. They are part of the entire universal church of Jesus Christ. They are part of his body and they are written in his book. Amen. And that's why God said, if you, if you take away from the words of this book, I will take your name out of the book of life. And I would not want to do that. I wouldn't want to do it to me. I wouldn't want it to happen to you. I don't want you for God to just cross you out and say, you're not coming. Okay. Uh, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. I'm not going to get into all that. 46 chromosomes. It looks like a ladder. There's a story in the Bible. It has a ladder in it. We call it Jacob's ladder. And it had angels going up and down on it. That's phosphorus. Angels are made of light. Okay, that's their substance, that's their being. They are, uh, they, they literally are light beings, okay? And so when you have the two uh, legs of the ladder made of phosphorus, that's the angels ascending and descending on the ladder to heaven. Or, as Jesus put it, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, who is the Word of God, who is the Bible, Somebody say amen. All right. It, it works sort of like, well, exactly like Morse code. It also works like computer code. Computer code is a switch on or off. And DNA basically is the same thing. It's either an on switch or an off switch. It's either pointed in one direction or another. And that's how DNA works. That's how it makes what's called the amino acids. And the amino acids are like the letters of the genetic alphabet. There are 22 letters or amino acids in the genetic alphabet, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So when God said, this is my book, and then he points to our DNA, his book, when he says that also is my book, then we should believe God. Amen. We should believe what he said. God wrote our DNA. Now, whether you like everything about it or not, does doesn't matter. God wrote it for you for his purpose. That's why we were created. For God's purpose, not ours. Okay, we're not going to be the king of kings, the Lord of lords. It's going to be God. Um, let's see here. What haven't we talked about yet? We talked about that and that. And thy word is a lamp into my feet and that and that. We talked about all of that. Oh, yeah. Take a look at this, Genesis chapter 5. This book is, in the Old Testament, it's a book of death. In the New Testament, it's a book of life. In the Old Testament, the first time the word book is used is in Genesis 5. And it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now stop and think about what I just said. Book, the word book in the Bible equals several things, one of which is DNA. So when you study in the Bible and you see the word book in the Bible, think of DNA. And I almost guarantee you there's going to be an application there somehow, some way. And in this case, there is. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And so Adam lived 930 years. When you go to the 930th chapter of the Bible, it takes you right to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. That's the 930th chapter of the Bible. 
And it starts out the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. It takes us from, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Isn't that neat? And they tell us, no, the uh, chapter and verse divisions, they were not uh, put in until later, so therefore they cannot be inspired. Okay, what I just told you was a fact. You can count it if you want to. You can count it the hard way, like I did at first, or... You can use the software. It's going to give you the same number. Matthew chapter 1 is the 930th chapter of the Bible. That's exactly how long Adam lived in years. And it takes you from the book of his generation, which is death, to the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, which is life. It just just looks to me like God put it there. You know, there's there's this idea that uh, philosophers use, lawyers use it all the time. It's, it has to do with something that's obvious. It doesn't need really a lot of scientific support. So let's say that you're uh, taking a walk down the road and there's a fence post there, wooden fence post, and you see a turtle sitting on top of that fence post. How did it get there? Huh? How did it get there? Someone put it up there. Let's see how easy that is. Is there any chance that the turtle climbed up there by himself? We know that. We know it for a fact. It doesn't need math. It doesn't need equations. It doesn't need a, a, a supercomputer to, to figure it out. It's an automatic, I see a turtle on a fence post. I know it didn't get there by itself. I know the wind didn't blow it up there. I know a, 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 a fox or coyote didn't come by and put it up there and save it for lunch later. I know that didn't happen. So someone must have put this turtle on top of that fence post. It's an automatic thing in our mind that we say that has to be done by somebody. And, and when you see all of these patterns in the Bible... You, you, you are looking at a turtle on a fence post. There is no way that anybody but God could have done this this way. No way. Okay? And I stand by that. Now, the last occurrence of the word book is a warning. Revelation 22, you might want to turn your Bible there. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life there it is and out of the holy city that means you're not here we go now a legally registered citizen of heaven does being a legal registered citizen mean something it does we have people Pouring in to our country from Mexico and the liberal left, they, they don't want to hurt their feelings, so they call them undocumented workers. Undocumented. What does that mean? They're not legally registered. That means that they are here illegally. And should they have the same rights no do what you're exactly right there's and there's a purpose behind that um paul was a roman citizen was he not and how did he get to be a roman citizen his father was a roman and so when the soldiers came to arrest paul And they were going to turn him over to the Jews. Paul said, hold on, fellas. Will you take a Roman citizen who is under the authority of Caesar 
and do with him what is illegal to do? And they were going, you're a Jew. How did you get to be a Roman citizen? One of the soldiers said, with a great sum of money, I purchased my citizenship. How is it that you can claim legal citizenship under Roman authority? And Paul said, my dad was a Roman. And the soldiers went, okay, uh, all you Jews, sit down, keep your mouth shut. There's nothing you can do about it. Paul's a Roman citizen. Therefore, he has a right to go and appeal before Caesar. And if Paul was not a legally registered, bona fide uh, son of a Roman citizen, the Jews would have killed him right then. But you see, having your name written down gives you a right to be where you are. I want you to think about that. You're in your house. Imagine you are in your house, George. Okay? And some people come in, and there, there are professional squatters in this country. And they look for houses that are empty, and they move in. And then it's, it is a horrible process to get them out, legally, to legally get them out. But this family comes in and they just walk in your house and they just start taking over. They move into your bedrooms. They start putting their stuff down in the kitchen. They start hanging stuff up on the walls. And you say, what are you doing? They say, well, we decided we're going to live here. You're saying no. How dare you? You know, I think Nancy Pelosi should let them live in her house. Oh, amen. Amen. Um, your name is on the title to that house and that property. That gives you a legal right. You're, if your wife got mad at you one day and said, get out, get out of here. I don't even want you on the property. You say, sorry, it doesn't work that way. I'm not saying she would. But it doesn't even work that way. Nobody can make him or force him off of his land or his house. He has a legal title to it. He is the one who has a legal right to be there. No one else does. And it's because their name is not written down. Okay? A lot of people say, I believe in God. That's not good enough. A lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. That's not good enough. My question to you is, is your name written in God's book of life because if it isn't you're claiming an illegal claim and there's there's penalties for that for claiming something that you say is yours and you know that it's not you know you have no paperwork on it whatsoever but you're going to make the claim anyway there's laws against that to keep people from doing that okay but in this case the last Use of the word book has everything to do with adding to it or taking away from it. It's a no-no. And since we're talking about DNA, that is exactly what we're referring to here. Um, let's see here. Where, where can I go now? Oh, I like this one. In thy book, all my members were written. Think about the number of men that wrote the Bible. Moses, Moses, well, Charlton Heston helped write the Bible, okay? Old oh, Chucky. Um, no, Moses wrote first five books of the Bible. Moses apparently attended his own funeral because he, he wrote about it. He wrote where God buried him, okay? Uh, that was either Moses and God gave it to him beforehand or... Some say that it was uh, Ezra, the ready scribe before the Lord, that by inspiration filled in that last little part of the book of Deuteronomy. Either way, it's inspired by God. Doesn't matter who wrote it, it's inspired by God. Uh, then you have John writing about the holy city, New Jerusalem. You have uh, Paul there uh, talking to the men there at, at Mars Hill. You have John the Baptist there on the bottom with his uh, uh, camel skin coat, uh, eating honey and wild locusts. And preaching the word of God. You have uh, Elijah. 
uh, preaching the word of God and calling down the fire of the Lord. All, and David, the, the, the musician, the psalm writer, the singer, um, all of these men having a part in writing the word of God. Okay, all of these men having that part. Uh, but here's the true author. Hebrews 5, 9, being made perfect, he, meaning Christ, became the author of eternal salvation. Now, what does an author do? Derek, what does an author do? <laughs> Can you answer it? What does an author do? He writes... He say he writes books. There you go. All right. An author writes books. In this case, the book that the author wrote is the book of eternal salvation. Without the book, you have no salvation. You have no way of going to heaven. You don't. Um, Andy Stanley, who is Charles Stanley's reprobate son, and he is a reprobate. Man, he is messed up. He is so messed up. Million miles away from what his dad was. And, um, and I wasn't a big Charles Stanley fan. But anyway, Andy Stanley is nuts. He, he preached a sermon where he said... Um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he said, a lot of you out there, and he's got a mega church, they follow him. And he says, uh, a lot of you say that you know that you are saved because the Bible tells you that you're saved. And he said, but what if it turns out that the Bible is wrong? What if there comes out some proof that God didn't really author the Bible. That God didn't really send the words down from heaven. That Paul didn't really write the words down that the Holy Ghost... In other words, he's saying... He, and, and he believes the Bible is wrong. He's saying that it is absolutely wrong and a, and a bad idea for you to base your knowledge of your salvation on what the Bible says because in his opinion, the Bible is wrong. And therefore, you're putting your hope and your trust into something that is flawed and has mistakes in it and is wrong. And I'm going, you're, cra you're not just crazy. You're a devil. That's a doctrine of devils right there. Okay? In fact, let me, listen, let me illustrate this. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, or if you're Spanish, Juan. Juan 1. Juan 1. Juan 1 1. Okay? Juan 1 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of what? The word of life. John is saying that not only have we heard the word of God. Not only have we seen it with our eyes. Not only have we looked upon it, but we've held it in our hands, meaning that the word of life is a tangible object. And I have had preachers who have told me, they, they, you know, they hear me say, I believe in the King James and I believe it's perfect. I believe it's right. And they'll say, well, I believe in the living word of God. Okay, what do you mean by that? And what they mean by that is they mean only Jesus is the word of God, a book cannot be the word of God because in their mind, and this is what they want, they don't want to tell you this, but it, that's what they believe. They believe that all the Bibles, including whatever one they use, has errors and mistakes in it. And so therefore, it does not qualify to be the book of your eternal salvation. It does not qualify to be 
the Bible, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for here? The, the book that's never wrong. I'll make it simple. No? Uh, in something or another. But the book is never wrong. Infallible, thank you. Thank you, fallible Gary. Uh, it, they don't believe the, the Bible's infallible. They believe it's got mistakes in it. And so naturally they would say, well, I believe in the living word. And in other words, they say, I, I believe in Jesus, but only believe in Jesus. Well, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus tells you, do what I say. Give heed to the words that I tell you. Do those things. Okay? Um, how about Hebrews 12 too? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of our faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you want faith? You're having trouble? I told this to everybody at uh, Cubby's sister funeral yesterday. I left them with these words. When you get home today and the uh, silence uh, there in your house and you're sitting there and you are remembering uh, this dear woman who passed away and uh, you start crying again and you start mourning her loss and you start uh, asking questions. God, why did, she, why did you take her? Then get it. And I said these words, you go get a King James Bible out and turn to John three sixteen because you know that verse and turn to uh, what was the other one I gave him, Cubby? Apparently you didn't listen. All right. Anyway, but anyway, um, no, I told him to turn to John three sixteen and oh, uh, uh, Psalm 23. And I said, those are two places that, you know, for sure in the Bible, you know exactly where they are. Read those. And then after you're done reading those, probably God will lead you to read other things in the Bible. And he's going to give you comfort. Because that's what God does. God, and what I wanted to leave those people with is the idea that they could believe what the Bible says in everything that it says. He's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, and that finisher of our faith means that no one else can come along after the Bible and try to increase our faith with something that's not in the Bible. Like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness or the Catholics or whatever. Anything that they add to the word of God, they've added something that they think is going to increase your faith. But here, Jesus is the author and finisher of it. One more verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the author of confusion. Say amen to that. But of peace as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. Meaning that now you, it doesn't mean that every time you read the Bible, you won't go, huh? There are things that I don't quite understand yet. But God has placed everything in this book in order. Uh, I mentioned the other day, they're selling, and they've been doing this for years, they sell what's called a chronological Bible. In other words, they put all the books of the Bible in chronological order rather than the order that they are uh, here. And they're, obviously they're saying to you, this is better because everything now is in chronological order and you can understand the Bible better, okay? But I believe that God already placed everything in order. I mean, when you find the 930th chapter of the Bible and it links with Adam being 900, when you find something like that, you're going, well, I can't move Matthew 1 out of place because that would destroy that pattern. And then all as you keep going and going, you realize that everything in this book is perfectly in order. And it doesn't need somebody to come along and change it for man's betterment. Okay, it doesn't add to faith, it destroys it. Let's pray the bell ring. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. And Father, we, we just pray, God, that you would just give a hunger and a thirst for righteousness for this word. We thank you, Father, for 
uh, finishing and completing our faith. And that, Lord, that if we want to know something, you can show it to us from this blessed book. And we'll know it then for eternity because we believe your word. Bless us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.